Uh, okay, so the next thing, let's start with the HCI design and research methodologies. Uh, it might sound complicated, like methodologies, okay, we don't want to do this, uh, but these tools really help you to make products better. Well, that th these are the tools that are actually uh, used by many, many people around the world in different research labs, design labs, uh, and using them, we can guarantee the room, and it's not really working out. Uh, it's just a template encouragement to think outside the room uh, and not spend your time working on the classical uh, methods. Uh, I know that the next week is the week of uh, self-reflection for you, uh, where you need to come up with your own uh, ideas, project ideas, uh, and try to go out uh, somewhere, walk in the park, and think about this, but don't stay uh, in your room. So why it's important to uh, evaluate human-computer interaction uh, from, the multiple from the multiple perspectives? So we have designers, researchers, customers, managers, we have users, we have different agents who are interested in the final product. Uh, and from each perspective, it's important to uh, qualify the standard of the product and make sure it's, it's, it's the best. Uh, designers are interested in the user. Uh, actually, so pe person is the human is the central part of the whole uh, hierarchy of the life. Uh, researchers uh, like myself, we are interested in uh, creating the knowledge base. We are interested in inventing new methods, testing existing methods, understanding what's not covered, what techniques that they are looking for. Uh, managers, well, they try to guarantee effectiveness of the system or of the tools that they are using. And finally, uh, marketing team uh, wants to showcase something to guarantee the nice performance of the unit uh, or the company. This is how it works, <laughs> the whole interaction. <laughs> it's a very super mega complicated scheme, but actually it's very simple if you uh, look at it from the perspective. Yeah, so... Uh, this is like a cycle of how people evaluate things. Um, at the top we have goals, like what are the goals on each cycle uh, of the user interface evaluation and usability engineering. Uh, in the middle are the methods that we're using, so we're constantly changing our methods based on our base. Uh, and the last is the products that we're supposed to have at the end of each cycle. Uh, so, so the first one, they don't really have a name, it's like a phase one, two, three, and four. Uh, it depends on the product that you're working on, or th that you're building. You might want to skip the phase if it's something really uh, simple. Uh, but the goals actually are uh, quite identified for the each case. So uh, you try to understand who your user are, key task of the user, what user is performing uh, during the first fra uh, phrase. Uh, then you need to understand the designs, so designs of your product. Uh, is it a mock-up? Is it like 5,000 images of something? Uh, is it a new holographic car uh, or something else? Uh, then you basically repeat, you redefine uh, your design, you correct mistakes, you get more uh, data from your methods that you gather, for example, from the interviews. Uh, or different discussions with your user. Uh, and uh, at the end, your goal is to complete your design, to finalize your design and have the final product. So the methods uh, are, are, as I mentioned before, are different uh, during each, uh, each phrase of this cycle. Uh, they're all user-oriented because we just want to talk to users. Since it's human-computer interaction, we are, first of all, uh, evaluating our hu human because we want to uh, understand our users. Uh, uh, and at the end, we are evaluating our system. So the task-centered system design, participatory design, and user-centered design are, are three methods that are used during the first phrase. This basically are the designs methods that are trying to understand that who are our users and what they want to do. Interview techniques, uh, different conversations and discussions. I will uh, talk about the methods within them uh, later on. But these are mainly those methods understanding the user. Then we create our first product. It's a user task description. Who they are, their age, 
their education, profession, preferences, hobbies, um, et cetera, et cetera, all, this, all the data that you can gather from the user. Um, then you evaluate that and you create new designs. So, for example, you need to create a new system where people can choose the presents for their family. So it's like augmented reality shop where you can buy anything. In the second phrase is to create low fidelity prototype. Uh, it's basically the prototype that you create from uh, secondhand things that you have at home, from paper, from, uh, I don't know, rubber bands, uh, plastic strings. It's something that's like hands-on and really easy to do at home. Slides as well. Uh, then you finally you reached your goal, you completed your design, uh, and you're, you're stuck in this constant loop between field testing uh, and your uh, complete specification prototype. Uh, it's like you have this like car, you 3D printed your uh, car or something else, uh, and you go to the user, test it, uh, go back and release the new version of the prototype. Usually this uh, process can be modified, depends on your needs. You can have different methods in the middle, but you may notice that it repeats itself, so it's always refining and redefining your design based on the feedback, because you always get uh, a new impressions and uh, a new ideas of how, that, how the product needs to be changed. Sometimes it's not wise to listen to the user, because the user might not know what or she she or she wants. So it's always need, need to try to be critical and think critically about the, I don't know, normal ages, uh, ages of uh, common sense and try to trust, first of all, your uh, aims of your project. So, yeah, maybe the logical question is like, what method is the best? And it, it's not what method is the best, there is no like this is the best method. Uh, it's always the best method that answers your uh, your question that you're asking. Sometimes uh, one method is absolutely perfect for one reason, but when you're working on a similar project, but your uh, aim and research question is absolutely different, uh, it's just better to use a different method because it doesn't have any uh, qualifications uh, to fulfill that goals. Um, um, why do we need to use different methods? Uh, because, because, well, it's all methods are different and they fulfill different needs. Uh, for example, um, uh, during the, this spatial computing era, uh, I personally was trying to understand how to evaluate spatial interface and how to evaluate spatial systems. So there are not, no existing methods evaluating uh, augmented reality interactions <coughs> in augmented reality user interfaces. Uh, I tried to revisit all the existing methods all the existing usability methods, and I understand that they just don't cover the aspects such as uh, navigation in the space, uh, personal uh, interactions with the physical environment around in the room or in the different spaces. Uh, and in this case, uh, we in the lab, we created the new methods uh, to evaluate uh, spatial user interface design. Uh, and sometimes you need to mix your methods because uh, there are more valuable. For example, you want to mix interviews and some uh, a quantitative tests. Uh, each method has its own weaknesses and limitations. Uh, if you read upon one method, you might want to say, okay, it has its own weaknesses, and in this case you'll think, okay, I will fulfill this by doing another method, by doing some interviews and something else. And uh, also, uh, it's a common in research when uh, one method uh, complements uh, another, giving more data to analyze, giving more data and more insights to support your hypothesis or a research question. Uh, it's all relative as well to the uh, non-research aims uh, when you're trying to find how the product will behave in a different environment, for example. So uh, try to always find uh, which of them uh, helps you to get the data that you want from the user. Do you need to give them tests? Do you need to answer interviews? Do you need to uh, heuristic evaluation or something else? So now let's talk about the methods now. The first one, uh, laboratory tests. So it's like probably the first thing that come uh, up to your mind. So you have this lab, you have um, researchers in ropes uh, and 
uh, for that you need uh, human subjects actually to be in, in, in the lab. So these are the uh, highly controlled observations when you're looking at the behavioral uh, of the people. It might be something like you give a prototype to a person who's sitting in the room uh, and then you're observing that person from this mirror glass wall like in the police department somewhere. So you're trying to understand how that person reacts and behaves. Uh, and that is highly controlled environment where you want to correctly and really precisely answer your question, your hypothesis. Um, and some usability testing in the lab. So there are less uh, controlled observations, but you're giving persons to try your prototype and you observe uh, the behavior. It's basically descriptive methods uh, where you describe how the person behaves. Uh, it's like if you created the AR application and you want to see how the person will behave in one particular environment, uh, that's the method uh, you will use the usability testing uh, in the room on site, for example. Uh, the next method is interface inspection. Uh, it's basically, you don't really need to have real end users with you at the end. You can ask your uh, lab uh, colleagues uh, or someone who is specialized in uh, user interface uh, evaluation. Uh, it's called usability heuristics, uh, where several experts uh, analyze. So uh, heuristics are the statements. Uh, it's like, for example, statement of, I can see the, the progress of the application is visible. Do you know like the progress bar? For example, when you're loading an application, you see the progress bar and you can track uh, how long does it take to uh, finish that. Um, and heuristics are uh, the statement, the collection of the statements that researchers collected to describe particular things. Uh, there are three main group of heuristics. The most famous is Norman's group of heuristics. I didn't put it here because it's really a uh, deep uh, topic, but uh, basically it's just uh, a classical uh, set of statements that you wanted to apply uh, to the product, to the application when you're analyzing something. And statements are like, I, I was able to see the progress, uh, I understand my state where I am now in the system, etc., etc. Uh, and also the walkthroughs. Uh, it's where the experts uh, analyze, uh, analyzing the interface uh, when, when someone is performing the task. So classical example with AR, someone is wearing the HoloLens, uh, and basically that person is talking while doing what he or he is experiencing right now. Uh, and the researcher or observer can ask some additional questions and the con conversation is recorded or video recorded as well. Uh, the next method is field studies. Uh, uh, it, it's not so, I wouldn't say that it's very relative to augmented reality, but it's a classical method for sociology. Uh, and uh, since HCI is uh, some part sociology as well, uh, but it's basically, the step where you will immerse yourself into the environment of the user. Uh, ethnography, ethnography is the classical uh, example. You are try to understand the culture and the behavior of the person. So for example, you need to create an application for um, a hospital. You've never <coughs> been there, you have a brief understanding of how it works, how it looks, but you need to understand the system, for example, of an IR, um, ENR unit. Uh, emergency unit anyway, uh, and you go there, you spend a day, a week, three weeks, depends on your needs, and you observe uh, everything that you see. Uh, some, you don't really need to <coughs> ask uh, questions, you don't need to interact. The important point is just to be really attentive to all the things that are happening uh, in the environment. Or, for example, in the classroom, you see how people, how f people, for example, walk around something. Maybe. Uh, the path that they're walking is not really comfortable and you can spot that, okay, I can change the, this by doing A, B, and C. So it's really about observing. Uh, these two below, contextual inquiry and deployment studies are similar, but the ethnography is the most uh, common where you immerse yourself. Uh, the next one is self-reporting. This is a very super classical and the most, I don't know, the most used uh, uh, methods, interviews, questionnaires, and surveys. Um, questionnaires and surveys are really easy to conduct because you can just simply send the link 
and collect the data that you will analyze is the standard uh, quantitative methods. Uh, interviews, uh, there are many types of interviews, structured interview, semi-structured interview, unstructured interviews. It's like when you don't have a prepared script for an interview, for example. Uh, but this is the typical methods for people use in journalism, uh, uh, HCI, when they need to get an insight from uh, the person and they prepare a list of questions for that. But self-reporting can be biased as well because it's not, uh, it's not an observation. Uh, sometimes people can lie in their questions. Uh, you may say, okay, I did that a couple of times when I was too lazy to complete that uh, uh, online survey or something like this. Uh, but to uh, collect the approximately uh, relevant data, you need to have a, a big sample. So don't ask one person about your system. Ask 10 uh, or ask 15. Uh, just uh, have a really nice sample for that. Uh, next way is a, is, a, is a cognitive modeling. So cognitive modeling is a method that uh, requires interface specifications. Currently, it's used only uh, on the computers, on 2D screens. Uh, and these methods are mathematical methods that, are, that predict user reactions, time people will spend on doing something. Uh, I will show you uh, a picture in a second. For example, this is the Fitz law. Uh, it's like the nice formula, and that predicts the time that user needs to uh, spend on moving from one point on the screen to another. For example, how long does it take for you to uh, look from the cross uh, button on the screen to the menu button on the screen? So how, how people will interact with different parts of your user interface element. And it was really hard to adapt that system for augmented reality because uh, it's, it's really into 3D. And there is an adaptation of Fitz law uh, by Cha and Moink in from 2003, uh, it's like the an extension, um, extended Fitz law. Uh, so they revised uh, it and created the 3D sort of timer. So how would you move uh, in 3D? Uh, I'm not sure that at this point uh, on your research you will use this method. It's maybe something more advanced that you want to uh, use further in your studies uh, or career. Uh, but I'm just describing that there is uh, these types of methods, and maybe in the future they will more uh, sophisticated ways of evaluating uh, uh, distances in, in augmented reality. Um, so this part, uh, so I, I, I just finished with uh, design methods, uh, and now it's the research methods. Uh, basically, the methods that are mainly self-reporting, uh, quantitative methods. Uh, that are commonly used particularly with AR, uh, because I, I try to focus this presentation on uh, AR mainly. Uh, and these are the methods that we commonly use uh, in the lab during all the trials and experiments that we did. Uh, very common, but you can at some point ask yourself a question, is it, like, is it relative to augmented reality? Uh, does it still cover all the needs that you want to have at the end? Um, so one is the first one is the simulator sickness. So maybe the most relevant to VR and AR where people try to understand whether the system will make you sick, uh, uh, motion sick, uh, because it's like the first thing. Oh, I don't want to use it because it will make me motion sick. Oh, I try VR once and it, it's not working. Uh, but since um, each application is unique, uh, environment is unique, you need to always think about how the, pe how the person will behave uh, in this environment. Uh, Simulator Sickness Questionnaire has 14 questions uh, and ask you about your physical state and your uh, physical experiences. Uh, technology acceptance and use, uh, usability, use satisfa satisfaction, user interaction satisfaction, and use of transfer mechanisms, just in a second, will be. Uh, technology acceptance is basically whether we want to use that technology uh, it's a method developed both for AR and classical technology as computer screens, website, etc. Uh, and it tries to understand whether people accept affordances of that system. If you recall the affordances topic from the previous lecture, affordances are the means uh, 
physical or digital means of the environment that we are using and perceiving from the world. Uh, and technology exceptions evaluate these affordances. Uh, for example, uh, augmented path, uh, directed focus, uh, cues and clues. Uh, these are the ways system helps you to navigate and to walk through the application. So what are the sort of power that application gives you? Um, and for example, we, uh, it's almost uh, in March of this year, it's end of the three year project uh, that we were working uh, in the labs where verbal experience for knowledge intensive training. Uh, and we were working within three different domains, medicine, uh, aviation and space. Uh, we run that uh, technology acceptance questionnaire with them uh, and we try to understand what is exactly missing, what we, what we need to uh, add to our system, uh, like feedback from the system, controllers uh, or more 3D models and animations. Uh, and visually it really helps you to see your results and modify your system based on the user answers and, need and needs. Uh, also, the classical method of the system elevation and system usability questionnaire uh, is called SUS. Uh, it's a very standard uh, way of elevating uh, usability. Uh, so, in 2017, uh, our system scored 66.4. Uh, we're still analyzing the new data that we gathered during the last year and a half, so we, I don't have, unfortunately, the new data. Uh, but you can see that it's pretty, pretty good. It's uh, a marginal height, so it's uh, above uh, 50, uh, good uh, performance, uh, sort of. Uh, and this uh, SUS uh, questionnaire also good, but I personally uh, feel that system usability is something that needs to be uh, uh, added to other methods, like qualitative methods, for example, interviews or semi-structured interviews, when something is missing uh, from the point of spatial interaction, for example. Uh, there is also similar question smart classes user satisfaction that asks you less questions so whether you uh, like the performance uh, and the method we developed in the lab uh, and the performance augmentation lab here at Brooks is a spatial UI evaluation uh, it's a set of 29 questions that are looking at the standard uh, tasks that people perform in augmented reality uh, system control navigation manipulation selection and different modes so this is basically an advanced system usability scale because uh, we found that system usability does not really reflect on something that spatial UI uh, evaluation <coughs> reflects like navigation in the environment and how people behave uh, with the physical environment. So it's always about asking your question, what is the aim, uh, what I want to achieve and by that you can choose the right and relative method. So I didn't have the right methods, so we created a new one. We will start to work uh, with the design thinking method. Uh, is the classical uh, HCI method uh, that we will work during the tutorial. So basically the design thinking is the continuous jump, it's like a loop between analysis and synthesis. So you create something and then you analyze it. You create your prototype and then you analyze it with the user. Uh, in design thinking, uh, humans always come first because we build for them uh, and I constantly saying that to you that you need to talk to a user. Uh, uh, any, any, anything that you make has to fit their agenda, their everyday life, but not your uh, imaginative <coughs> world unless you're designing for yourself. And it's about understanding them. It's about stepping into their shoes. It's about understanding their everyday life, whether they're working in a factory, whether they're in the hospital. Uh, it's just, if, even if it's painful, you need to do that. Um, so, first of all, try to trust the user to tell first things that you want them to tell. Allow the user to express what they want, what they feel, because they might feel pressured and not share that with you from the first point. So uh, imagine that, that I think this graph is just perfect about 
the user has all these like preferences. I don't know what I want. I'm always looking for something else. Uh, and engineer first tries to, like, to touch briefly the surface of the user, tries to, okay, to understand the scale of the problem. Um, but it should be like this. Uh, in reality, input and the system should be very, very simple. Uh, not, not like this, it doesn't need to couple with all the things that you design. It needs to be really simple, you need to understand it. Uh, and, and this is a designer, an engineer and designer, it's like even more complicated, but the output is very simple and the interaction is very uh, perfect at the end. Uh, one of my favorite uh, examples of uh, implementation of design thinking method is the Great Western Railway Service. Uh, 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 in the United Kingdom. So, like many, many years <coughs> ago, there was uh, an engineer from Oxfordshire, uh, Isambard Brunel, uh, and he was up to creating like the railway service to connect London and, uh, and Oxford. It was like the first uh, railroad. Uh, and what he did, I think this is like, the first, uh, first, uh, first time someone tried to use the method of design thinking. And he was trying to go from London Paddington uh, to Oxford to different other sites. I thought, oh, it's really, we can just go and build a straight line. Let's build a straight line and we will have our railway. Uh, but he thought, oh, no, I want to have a perfect railway service. Uh, and what they did, they basically moved all, all the lands. They removed the hills because they wanted to have the straight uh, rail so the user will have a nice uh, and perfect journey without shaking uh, uh, carriages uh, uh, on the train uh, and etc etc so he really thought about how the person will feel using that train about their everyday experiences about the consequences of those everyday experiences on their lives and the, on the lives of others so if you have a pleasant journey you will be happy, satisfied, but I really love the, this example because it's also, uh, it's a national matter. So it's just a one road, but it changed uh, a, a lot of uh, things uh, in the UK. Uh, I know it's not so perfect actually because I took a train from London this morning and it still was shaky, <laughs> I was testing that, uh, but it's, it's better than uh, if it were this hilly road. Uh, the second example I like is the Cool Biz campaign uh, in Japan. Uh, they were trying to solve the national problem of raising uh, levels of carbon, and they needed to find a solution why why it is happening. Uh, so the problem was that uh, in the typical Japanese culture, you need to look very smart and uh, presentable. Uh, and in all office the offices, they had air conditioning. And air conditioning was set up to, let's pretend, 18 degrees. Uh, and it was really absolutely okay for men to have a suit, and they felt comfortable uh, in that temperature. Uh, but for women, in 18 degrees, they were freezing. But they still needed to have the skirt uh, and the short top. So they changed the level uh, of carbon in Japan, I think 10 years ago, by changing r the rules of the everyday uniform. So they reduced the uh, temperature of air conditioner to, uh, to 20, uh, and they still were able to feel comfortable in that temperature, uh, but without feeling ashamed of how they feel, because the prime minister uh, and all the government in Japan, they highly supported this campaign, uh, they had the special fashion shows that this is okay uh, in Japan to have casual uh, look, and they uh, saved the country from uh, ecological disaster by just changing the perception uh, of how it's okay to look in Japan. Uh, design thinking encourages you to observe and see some hidden path that you might not see from the first time. Sometimes it's really a hidden journey. Uh, my personal discovery is that uh, 
in Norway, in Norway, people don't like to look up. Like, why people don't like to look up? Uh, because we had this like application in a year with all the navigational systems, and they didn't really lo look at the uh, top part of the experience, and they tried to talk about them uh, like outside of the office hours. Like, why do you like things? Uh, on top of the application, why don't you just look there? And uh, and it was absolutely uh, like no reasonable answers. Like I don't know, it's just this happens. Um, we are just so focused on things on the sides. Uh, and then uh, at some point, I noticed that Norwegians, uh, especially uh, above the polar polar circle, it's really cold there. It's freezing. Uh, sometimes it's like polar night for the half year, and they commute uh, in the underground tunnels. And tunnels, they, they have really bright lights on top of the tunnels, so it's really painful for them to look up. That's why they feel uncomfortable uh, looking up. Uh, sometimes discoveries, uh, they just appear through random conversations. Uh, but try to look at the world through the eyes of uh, others, because sometimes it's really uh, unexpected uh, and unimaginable discovery. Uh, another two <coughs> examples of experience engineering. Uh, do you know who Whole Foods supermarket? So each supermarket has its own different design. So each Whole Foods in the world is different. There are no predefined store layouts at all because they just want to create uh, a customized experience from each city. Uh, and for example, the Hotel Four Seasons, uh, they do employee trainings, uh, and for each employee to perform perfectly, they arrange a one week uh, stay at this hotel as a user, as a person who is on holiday, and they observe what type of service they supposed to receive, uh, and during the day work, uh, they sort of follow that personal example. So, also ask your questions, what are people trying to achieve as individuals in your experience? What is the aim of this application? What they, do they want to be healthier, fitter, smarter, or happier, or they just want to know more about a particular thing? You just want to help them to solve problem of daily commute? Um, I don't know, they don't know what to listen in the evening, or they're struggling to learn anatomy or something else. So, uh, and in this case, you're creating not for people, but you are creating with people because only with them you're able to find discoveries. Uh, maybe next week you will think, okay, I have this idea, I want to do this, like straight away I need to do this. But maybe your idea is just for yourself. Uh, it's just idea for one person. You need to talk to people who had this problem or ha had experienced something. Maybe you can recall someone complaining about something. And you need to keep that context in mind, keep context of the conversation in mind. Will people use that your system at home or, or somewhere else, or they will use it once per week? You need to think about the, the environment, like city, home, medical, uh, educational setting, workplace, because your design will be predetermined by these environments and you will use uh, different research methods for that as well. <coughs>